So, chronic pain patients used to make me feel quite emotional. They still do sometimes, but I get to work in the chronic pain clinic at Gritsky, and so I've, I've got a bit of a story to tell about what it's like to work there. Um, so, John is in his 50s. He's a construction worker. In his community, he's got quite a good job. He's a foreman. Uh, he's the sole breadwinner in his house, and he's become a bit of a, a figure in his community because of the work that he does. He can fix people's houses. Um, it's really quite important to him, and it's part of his identity. But about three years ago, he stepped off a ladder, strangely, and felt a twinge in his back. He was out for a little while, and then a few months later, he did it again and again, and he found himself in this spiral where his pain in his lower back began to become more and more persistent, and his flares more and more frequent and more and more painful, and his pain began to spread to his legs and up his back and into his neck. And the pain became so bad, it started to own his life. And his relationship with his wife began to break down. With his kids, he became socially isolated. He was losing that role in society, and he was going to lose his job. He was going to lose the means that he had to support his family. And he comes to your ED. But it's not the first time. You've seen John many times. And he comes in every time. And when you see him, he's angry. He's angry and he's desperate because he's gone to how many doctors and how many different hospitals and how many different centers. He's paid money where, where, where he thought it might help. And they've done scans like MRI scans and they've examined him. And they've said, you've got no red flags, buddy. If I look at the scan, you know, I can't see anything that here that I can fix. And the message he's getting is, I'm going crazy. This pain is all in my head. Nobody ever leaves me. And I think when I see John, I get that feeling too. Like, this is so frustrating, John. There's nothing wrong with you. Get out of here. I've got real patients to look after. But on the other hand, I'm going, here's a man who's desperate. He needs my help. And I've been trained all my life to help him. But I've got nothing to give him. I've got nothing I, I, I can do for him. Except, you know, do that magic thing where you write it on a piece of paper and it disappears over a counter and it comes back magically as a pill. <laughs> but rarely I'm treating me and not him there. I think it's a heart sink moment. But I want to tell you how I have learned over the last few years that I think we've got hope for John. I think we can turn this into a good news story. But I've got to take you a step back first. So I want to ask you to look at um, these pictures. I I'm not sure if it's exactly clear, but this is a gentleman at a Sundance Festival who's hanging in midair by some meat hooks. So for, for 30 seconds, turn to the person next to you, and I want you to tell them who you think is having the worst pain experience, and I want you to tell them why you think that. What is it about their experience that's making it the worst experience? 30 seconds and uh, seem to come up. From what you can see, our man at the Sundance Festival, he's got the worst tissue damage. Are we, are we happy that from what we can see, he's got the worst tissue damage? By a show of hands, who thought he's having the worst pain experience? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> uh, okay. When you spoke about one of these other three who you thought was having the worst pain experience, who have you spoke about something that described the context, the situation around that patient, as how it influenced their pain experience. Who, who spoke about the context? And did anybody think about what that experience means to that individual? Did anybody talk about, for instance, our Sundance Festival man, what his experience meant to him? Did anybody talk about meaning a little bit? Maybe not so much? Where am I going with this? I, I'm hoping that, that you learn from this particular slide that context and meaning affect our pain experience. 
and that pain and tissue damage can be decoupled. <laughs> good one, right? Good one. You cut my finger, I'm sore. Okay, I get that, right? But particularly <laughs> in chronic pain, particularly in chronic pain, pain and tissue damage can be decoupled. They are neither necessary nor sufficient to cause each other. If you don't believe me, just park it. Just park it. I'm hoping you'll believe me by the end. So what is pain then? Pain is a construct of the brain in response to threat. We need it. It's helpful. It keeps us safe. It's a really powerful behavior change mechanism. If you put your hand on a hot plate, your, your brain needs to move your body fast to keep you safe and so it makes your whole being about the pain in your hand, you move away quickly. Pain is your body's way of keeping, is your brain, brain's way of keeping you safe. Pain is a response to threat. But pain and tissue damage can be decoupled, especially in chronic pain. If we look at John, if we go back to John, John's MRIs are normal. There's no tissue damage in his back that doctors can, can use to explain why he has such intense pain. But if his pain goes on like this, he loses his job, his position in society, his marriage. What's happening in his back is a huge threat to who he is. So hopefully, you guys are starting to get this idea that pain can be decoupled from tissue damage and pain is a threat. But how do we fix it? In your ED, when you've got a short period of time, I'm not saying it's easy, but hopefully, with this framework, you might be able to have a discussion with your patients. So the first thing is, the principle of a discussion around pain must be about agency. You are going to give John the tools to take his life back. To own his life instead of to being owned by pain. He's going to take control. But you've got to deal with the context. So what does that mean? The first thing you've got to do is you've got to convince John that you understand him. And the way you do that is by listening. And I know that's hard in the ED because you've got a million patients waiting. It's why I left the ED. Because uh, that's hard. That's really hard. That's really hard. To, to, to give him a, a long period of time, but you do need to acknowledge that his pain is real, even though the tissue damage is not real, the pain is real. He's not crazy, he's in pain. And there are very clear, well understood scientific mechanisms, changes in your brain that are driving that pain. And then you need, need to give him something to focus on, something to, to go at. And uh, if you're a millennial and you're looking for something to focus on, something to discuss something to think about, you give them a hashtag. All right? <laughs> it's a bit of a shoehorn, but, but bear with me. Uh, and the first thing you're going to put in that goal, and I think for them to think about, is you, you've got to try and deal with what the pain means for him. We've got to try and take John on a journey that causes a cognitive shift away from pain equals t tissue damage towards <coughs> pain equals threat. And if I'm not under threat, then I may not be in pain. So how do we do it? Okay. So if you're still not believing me about this whole pain versus tissue damage thing, maybe you will after you hear what I say to John. So it's called pain neuroscience education. The physios are leading the way in this. Um, it's evidence-based uh, and it comes from really hard neuroscience. Um, and we know that if, if you put your educator hat on and you think you're, you're trying to change somebody's understanding of a concept, we know that <laughs> Just being didactic is not going to work. So we're going to take him on a journey using metaphor, experience, story, narrative and take him to a point where, where he makes the connection himself. So think about whether you can do this. So John, I, I just want to show you a picture. So this is a house. John, you build houses, you know about houses. Um, do you ever install a uh, burglar alarm? Well, yes, I do. I do so what we do with the burglar alarm is we have sensors on the doors and the windows and a sort of central processing unit, a box, a computer in, in, in the roof and then we have this siren. And how it works is, if this window opens, a signal is sent from the sensor to the computer, to the central processing unit, but the signal doesn't say danger, the, central, the signal says movement or, or the window's open. And the central processing unit, and yes, it's equivalent to your brain, goes, uh, 
Um, well, uh, yeah, it seems as if the uh, window is open on the second floor. Um, well, that could mean uh, danger. That must mean danger. Well, uh, we need to do something about that. Let's change some behavior. Let's turn the siren on. Woo, woo, woo. And your alarm goes off. The central processing unit has decided that there's danger and it needs to do something about it. It needs to warn you uh, or the ADT security. <laughs> ADT, Australia Foreigners, that's like a security company alarm. Company. Um, <laughs> but sometimes what happens is the wind blows and it rattles the window. And either because the sensor has had its sensitivity turned up, or because the signaling channels have become a bit deranged, or because something in the processing unit is not really understanding the signal well, the window rattles and the processing unit goes, uh, there um, uh, appears to be uh, some movement in the window on the second floor. Uh, I think that's danger. Sends the signal up to the siren, woo, 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 and the alarm goes off. So there isn't danger. But somewhere along this process, from sensing, conducting, <coughs> understanding, interpreting, making meaning of the signal, something's gone wrong. And the alarm has gone off. And that's how pain works. Well, that's how chronic pain works. When the tissue damage is no longer real, but the pain remains real. What happens if that signal keeps coming and that alarm keeps going off as it just starts to grow and grow and grow? And the intensity and the persistence continues until it owns your whole life. And John, that's where you are. Your pain's uh, owning your whole life. And we need to retrain your brain, we need to retrain your protection system, your alarm system, to turn down the volume, to turn down the sensitivity, and to teach your central processing unit to re-understand your body again. You need to retrain your brain. Any more converts? Maybe not. <laughs> um, another framework that I've used, or that has been used with me to try and understand chronic pain, um, has made quite a big difference to my understanding, and it works quite well for me, is to talk about sometimes pain is driven by what's happening in the peripheries. You cut your finger, you pull a muscle, you fracture a bone, that's what's driving the pain experience. But John's got nothing that we can find on scan or examination that's driving it, nothing in the peripheries that's doing it. So what's driving his pain experience? his spinal cord and his brain. It's been driven centrally. Sometimes pain is driven peripherally, sometimes it's driven centrally, sometimes it's a mixture of both. That seems to be a, a concept that clinicians can understand a bit easier than uh, pain as a response to threat. So if I take you back to our framework, we've, um, we know we're trying to give John agency. We've dealt with this context by listening to him, by getting a multidisciplinary team in to deal with his depression, counselors, give him some workplace-based uh, programs, and we're trying to shift his cognition. Now we need to teach him to breathe. And you are like, wow, I'm out. <laughs> I know this is the blue hippo, I know we, you know, we were passing around the green pipe earlier this morning. Uh, okay, so, so diaphragmatic breathing, you can call it yoga breathing, you can call it tactical breathing, you can call it what, it wants, well, what you want, but diaphragmatic breathing is an evidence-based strategy for giving self-efficacy and agency to the patient, for muscle relaxation, and for controlling their pain experience. And it works. And so what do I do? I teach them in my consulting room, and they sit there in the wheelchair they've never, they've never been out of for the last six months, and we breathe, and then, like some evangelical preacher, we stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and then we keep them breathing. And I say, did your back break? No, no doctor, my back didn't break. And we show them that they can. And we give them permission to start moving again. Because moving will not break your back. Which brings us to the next thing. Possibly our most powerful uh, weapon in the fight against chronic pain is exercise. Your brain and your body have this incredible relationship where your brain needs frequent signals from your body to prove to your brain that it's healthy, that it doesn't break when you move. And so exercise of any kind is helpful for training your brain 
that your body can move and your body's healthy. Science, guys. No, <laughs> not mumbo jumbo, science. Um, but you've got, to, you've got to be careful, you, you know, you, you can't just tell them to go and run a marathon in four months, it doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> Stepwise, goals, uh, very goal directed, incremental, and, and they must expect some two steps forward, one step back kind of uh, trajectory. So I hope I've given you a little feeling, for those of you it's new, maybe for some of you it's not, about this idea that particularly in chronic pain, pain can be decoupled from tissue damage. And the consistent message is to the patient that there is no, 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 no longer anything in your back that I can fix. The tissues are strong and healthy is important. Uh, some pain is driven peripherally and some pain is, uh, uh, pain is driven centrally. And that if you use a framework that starts with agency, giving power back to the patient, that means you deal with the context, you listen to them, you get your multidisciplinary team involved in their, psych in their psychology, in their psychiatry and the other issues in their life, that you, that you give them a cognitive shift, you help them go on a, on a journey towards cognitive shift and what their pain means. You teach them to breathe, <laughs> and you teach them to exercise, <laughs> that you can move them forward. <laughs> uh, I, I hope you can remember that. Um, <laughs> I think you'll be able to. Um, I, I, I promise, Kat, I will give you some links to some really great YouTube clips and some really great articles uh, that will help you incorporate this kind of pain neuroscience education and approach into your practices. And I'd, I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards. Um, thank you very much again to Bad EM, and also just a big thank you to all our sponsors and families who uh, allow us to come and live this uh, dream here on the weekend. <laughs>